If walls could talk, our homes would tell the story of our lives. Wow! These famous faces are going back through the front door where they once lived. Come this way. It's so small. <laughs> I can't believe I lived in this room. As memories come flooding back... This is out in John's kitchen. <laughs> ..they share with us their lives. Me and my brother Dean must have broken that window, that window and that window. Their dreams... I don't think I'll get this emotional, honestly. ..and their celebrity home secrets. Come on. Welcome to Casa del Harding. Once the wild child of girls allowed, this is Sarah Harding's home in Buckinghamshire. As you can see, this is this is the hub of the house. This is my kitchen. Yes, this is where I spend most of my time. It's always warm, so it's great in the winter. You love it, don't you? This is kind of my little old school room with my Chesterfields and my open fire, which is great at Christmas time. The famous Brits. Here I am. In 2002, Sarah shot to stardom in pop stars The Rivals back at the birth of reality TV. <laughs> that was at my audition, my first audition. The Britney Spears wannabe. I know it doesn't look it, but I was so nervous. So nervous. Oh, gives me a heebie jeebies. Back in the day. Today, Sarah's travelling back to her childhood home. She hasn't been here for 20 years. I honestly don't know what to expect, but there's going to be lots of memories that are going to come flooding back. <laughs> Born in 1981, she's come a long way since she lived under the Heathrow flight path in the village of Raysbury. Oh, God, I'm choking. <laughs> It's all times. It looks so different. <laughs> oh, wow. And it is just... It looks so much smaller than what I remember it. I don't think I'll get this emotional, honestly. Oh, can we go in? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's just so different. They've completely opened it out. This was all one big wall. I had my piano along this wall here, and there'd be two doors here and here. And I used to just be playing the piano all the time, tinkling away. I know, I was always just so active, you know. I was either playing on my computer, or I was out in the garden playing with the mud and the frogs, or climbing the trees, or playing on the piano. <laughs> I've got so many memories here. Oh, they've changed all the garden. Oh, my God, it's just so different. My climbing tree's not there. That's my old bedroom. I remember I've been bad once, and they locked me in my bedroom. <laughs> and I tied all my jumpers together. <laughs> and I tried to climb out the window, and I got to about here. The thing snapped, and I just fell slap bang on the bed. <laughs> that was the great escape. <sighs> Flipping heck. It's so small, <laughs> I can't believe I lived in this room. No wonder I wanted to escape. <laughs> oh. I used to have a big poster of there. I, I was one of these 17, but then when, when CDs became the rage and I got my first CD player, I remember that was over here, and I used to just play my CDs, um, play Mariah Carey nearly every night and practise singing Mariah Carey songs and Whitney Houston songs. I used to say to my dad, is this how you get famous? By singing in the shower. <laughs> and I used to just have, like, my own set list of songs I'd sing in that shower. I always start with Cheryl Crow. All I want to do is have some fun. I just knew that this was the path that I was chosen for. I remember when I was a kid, I had this little drawing book. I just remember drawing a picture of me being filmed by a camera crew walking up to a front door. It was so weird, it's like I almost predicted it. <laughs> it was going to happen. Sarah's dream of stardom received plenty of support from her family. I just grew up with music surrounding me. My dad was, he played all sorts of instruments, he was a musician. My brother plays all sorts of instruments, but mainly guitar. I used to go and like sing along with my dad's band. 
I was always the performer. I always wanted to put on a show for people. Be like, like everybody, be quiet. I have to do this. So I was very, I was very much the drama queen and um, putting on little shows and, and things like that. I think I was about 13. I had my very first electric guitar. It was a pale pink Marlin Sidewinder <laughs> guitar. And then I remember having a mini Marshall amp and I used to plug in my guitar. I just loved it. When Sarah's parents separated, she moved up to Manchester with her mum. I was about 14 when I left. I just remember having to put all my stuff into boxes in my rooms and packing all my CDs. Basically, my mum really just wanted to be closer to her family, and my dad still had work down here. So many memories. It just feels like I've spent my whole life here. But I've been away now longer than I lived here. It's so strange. Wow. <laughs> I think I'm still that little girl. <laughs> I think that's probably why. I think that's probably why it's still a bit emotional, because part of me still is that little girl. <laughs> Throughout her teenage years living with her mum in Manchester, Sarah took every chance she could to launch her singing career. I started travelling to North Wales once, twice a week. My mum would drive me there. And when I was old enough, I'd drive myself. And then as time went on, I'd do all the caravan parks. That was my apprenticeship. I'd get £60 for the gig, £15 would go to the manager, £15 would go on petrol, £15 would go to the PA system. And then at the end of it, I'd have 15 quid. <laughs> the size of Sarah's audience was about to see a dramatic transformation. In December 2002, she joined Girls Aloud, and a few months later, the record company put them up in these luxury apartments. Oh, wow. <laughs> Two messy girl alouds lived here. I first heard about the auditions for pop stars from a girl that I used to be in another girl group with, and I thought, I'll give it a go. Pop Stars The Rivals was one of the first ever reality TV talent shows. Viewers voted to create a boy band and a girl band who would fight it out for the Christmas number one. We waited the audition all the way through the night until 10 a.m. the next morning. I was absolutely shattered. <laughs> I scraped my hair back so tightly that next day because my eyeballs were hanging. There was something in your voice that was telling me don't be too sure. Money's on her. Sarah would only reach the final public vote if she survived eight weeks of elimination rounds. I was full of adrenaline. I was really excited, really hyper because I'd made it to the final. If you think that you might be going home, especially having come that far, it's a horrible feeling. And I remember Davina saying, and we'll get the finals, like you'll have the results of the final person into the band after the break. And that was the longest three minutes of my life standing there. The last member of the band is... Sarah. I just cried. <laughs> It was just like a massive sigh of relief that, you know, everything we'd gone through had finally been worth it. It wasn't until the next morning it actually sunk in. I had to literally, as I was brushing my teeth, I looked in the mirror and I had to pinch myself. I went, I've actually, I've made it. I've actually made it. All Girls Allowed had to do was beat the boys to the Christmas number one spot with their single, Sound of the Underground. It was such a strong song. I thought, right, we might actually win with a chance here. But girls like to buy boys' songs more than they would the girls. So we had to really fight for the girls. Sound of the Underground topped the Christmas charts, giving Sarah and the girls their first of four number ones.
Britain's hottest new pop group ruled the charts and ruled the roost at home. I thought, I remember the kitchen being longer, but they had, I think they did have another flat in this complex. We all moved around a few times while well, in the course of us all living here. When we first started the band, we lived out our suitcases. Um, wherever we, we laid our suitcase was our home. <laughs> And um, it was just nice to have a base, really, and and it was so exciting to finally have a, like a place of our own away from our parents' houses. I think the TV was over there. Um, I think there was um, like armchairs, like leather armchairs here, and it looks like someone's just moving in or moving out at the moment. Hence the deck chairs, as you can probably see. This building was originally Hatch Lunatic Asylum. It was once the biggest psychiatric hospital in Europe. 20 years ago, it was converted into luxury apartments. Today, a two-bed flat here costs around half a million pounds. We kind of nicknamed it Popstar Heights. There's loads of other bands, like Wanted lived there, and Busted lived there, and um, I think N-Dubs all lived there, and, and then you'd have the odd footballers living there. It was all kind of like loads of sort of faces that you, you'd recognise. This flat has some funny memories. Um, <laughs> they were right pranksters, Cheryl and Nicola. My first flat in this complex was just to the right above the gym. And I'd gone home to Manchester one weekend and the girls had got one of the people who worked here to ring and say, um, yes, there's been a fire at the gym. And I was at my mum's and I was lying on the sofa and, went, <gasps> and they went, sorry, the, the fire damage is really bad. Um, it's gone right through to your flat. And I, I literally burst out into tears. And then I heard them come on the phone cackling. I could have killed them. Thanks, girls. We were so used to each other. We were like sisters. But we did live in each other's pockets when we were working, so it was nice to have somewhere that we could call home and go home to, you know, at the end of the day. There's so much to think about and so much that's happened since being with the girls, since before being with the girls, since trying to make it. It's kind of brought it all back. <laughs> I'm so grateful. It's every girl's little dream. But Sarah knew her dream could come crashing down at any moment. You never know how long it's going to last, so, you know, you've got to invest wisely. Actress and singer Sarah Harding is best known for her string of hits with Girls Aloud. She's revisiting her former homes to reveal how she found fame. This is my first flat. This is um, Kentish Town. As you can see, it's the noisy one. Um, and it's that middle one right up there. And it was the first property I bought, and I completely gutted it and revamped it. So it'll be interesting to see what the new owners have done. OK. Shall we go in? In 2004, Sarah decided to move into her own party pad in the heart of London. Ooh. <laughs> it still looks cool. The old blinds are still here. It's my old sofa. <laughs> It still looks really lovely. Actually, now I do miss it. This used to be an old school. Buyers like Sarah snapped up flats in old schools, hospitals and churches when they were converted to provide much needed homes. When I first bought it, it was nothing like this. It was really dated. It had carpets. It didn't have all this wooden flooring. And obviously, I kept the original radiators, changed all the mezzanine. That was all banisters. I just changed everything. Everything's new. Sarah was about to discover owning your own home isn't all plain sailing. I also just remember living here when it was a building site, and that wasn't fun. <laughs> it was empty, a shell, dust, builders in every day, to the point where I literally some mornings went downstairs and slept in my car with my duvet because it was so noisy. <laughs> There's dicks! No way! <laughs> I would never have got away with having decks and playing with decks here last time I lived here. <laughs> Neighbours would have killed me. <laughs> That's awesome. 
This used to double up as a second bedroom. It was more like a snug, and I had a big sofa in this area, and you could move it into like a massive double bed and a TV on that wall. Um, but I really actually like what he's done. It's like a studio slash office. So uh, I wish I thought of this. While Sarah lived here, Girls Aloud were a hit-making machine. And in 2004, they scored their second number one. Oh, why you look so sad? It was around the time that we did I'll Stand By You that I was living here. And that video I loved because I didn't have to wear heels for 24 hours. Just literally, we were in some fake sand, or real sand, but in a studio, a fake desert setting in bare feet. And it was probably my most fun video because we didn't have sore feet. <laughs> My life was incredibly hectic when I lived here. I was travelling a lot, I was touring a lot. There was never really any real downtime living here because there's always stuff going on. So there wasn't really much relaxing. At 25 years old, my life had changed a lot considering I was able to buy this place and do it up. I don't think I know any other 25-year-old who was able to be that lucky. It's quite young to buy a house, isn't it? But. They always say to you, you never know how long it's going to last, so, you know, you've got to invest wisely. I'm really glad I came back. It was my first property I ever bought and did up as well. It would have been sad to see someone else change it completely, and it's, it's still the same as I remember it. It's a good old bachelor pad. <laughs> In 2007, Sarah moved to London's upmarket Hampstead to be near where Girls Aloud were rehearsing for their third tour. What do you think attracted me to this area? It's beautiful. I mean, what's there not to love about it? It's got the old lanterns. It all goes straight down to Hampstead Heath. And the houses are just so pretty. I, just, I loved it here. There was a lot of paparazzi attention at the time when I was living here, and Claude was a little puppy. I was often packed walking down here up to Hampstead Heath. We didn't really get much privacy, unfortunately. It's no surprise that even Sarah's dog was pursued by the press. Girls Aloud were at the height of their fame. Their next single, The Promise, gave them their biggest hit. They'd been nominated for a Brit Award three times, but had never won. And the winner is... Girls Aloud! The Promise! That was definitely the highlight, I think, of my career. And also the most embarrassing. It's about time! I think I just wet myself. Here you go. I just went crazy. <laughs> oh, it was like an out-of-body experience. Oh. Only months later, with a new record deal signed and a hugely successful live tour behind them, Girls Aloud made an announcement that shocked their fans. We'd been going for seven years solid, and it was literally album, promo, tour. It was just getting a little bit monotonous at the time, so it was only, I don't think it was meant to be three years, but we decided to take a little break. Sarah had spent her whole adult life in front of the cameras, but the difference between public life and private time was becoming too blurred. Unfortunately, the paparazzi were on my doorstep every day. <laughs> So I didn't really get much of a life, so I was indoors a lot. So I took that decision to move and go back to the countryside and have a bit more of a private life. I mean, who wants to travel all that way out there all the time just to take pictures of little old me getting a bottle of milk? <laughs> and this is the house Sarah moved to, a rambling country pile in Buckinghamshire, which she shares with her two cats and three dogs. All right. So, moving on, we have my little uh, wall of accolades. This is just a few of them. These are all of our singles that we had up to, up to the loving kind, but we had obviously a few more after that. In 2012, after a three-year break, Girls Aloud reunited for the group's 10th anniversary before finally going their separate ways.
as well as her success with Girls Aloud, Sarah's achieved her childhood dream to put on a show in other ways. Hey, Roxy, promise you'll write me. Well, St Trinian's came about when I lived here. I was kind of quite typecast as the rock chick, but that was cool. But I was, I was playing much of a, a cooler character in that. But when people know me, I know I'm a bit of a geek, really. <laughs> and Ricky Wilson played my boyfriend. Love you, babe. Whatever. I'd love to play a bad, like a bad Bond girl, like Grace Jones, <laughs> like a baddie. Apart from that, music's my first love, definitely. This is, this is kind of my little cave where I sort of like to have a go on my decks. I'm a bit of a bedroom DJ or I've written songs here or I practice on my guitar in here. This is my little kind of music room. Um, and I just get some inspiration when I'm in here, really. <laughs> This journey, it's been a bit overwhelming at times. I just have so many fond memories of Raysbury. I think when you're a kid, everything's just sort of carefree, isn't it? I've had so many brilliant times living in Kentish Town, but I've grown out of that kind of life now. I will always have something to do with music in my life. I didn't expect sort of the gravity of the fame that came with it, you know? It was just, uh, it kind of excelled overnight. And I think a lot of people just want to be famous. It can be very fickle. It can work in your favour, and sometimes it doesn't. And I think the hardest thing is just learning to accept that. The only thing I'd love, and I do take to heart, is what I love doing, and that's my music.